Omarie, fakalova lahiatu. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Friday Night Live with Talano Asao. It's my great pleasure to welcome you in. My name is Eli Dikile. Without further ado, let me bring in one of my co hosts. This is Liao Tilsley. Liao, talofa. Talofa. Ali, you are on time. <laughs> hoi, 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 hoi. Of course. <laughs> Great to see you, Liao. How's things going? Really well. Been a good week. Oh, good, 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 good. And now. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Uh, sorry, sorry, guys. Looks like Liao's a little bit picky in and out. There's a little internet, some fun stuff, as we usually do in Auckland. And welcoming back to the stage, we've got our long-lost brother, long-lost Toko, Uso. That is Fuyavai Lili Alai Lima. Fuyavai, Tarofa. Malolava. Yeah, toi fai Tarofa, tūlu pa ia manu me malu wa mfai na fai tasi mai, le nei a fiafi. Ia tato po kala me maasani lava le nei o le tala no sao. Mo lo ngoa fuya vai lili ala ilima. Welcome everyone, and it's good to be back. How are you guys doing? Oh, very good, very good. So good to see you, bro. Very good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, awesome, 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 awesome. So uh, I think it's going to be a great night as per always. Look, just for our audience, thank you so much for coming in and joining us. It is really a pleasure to have you here. As per usual, we do love to have you discuss and ha- get engaged in that Talanoa. All right, and th- tonight is no exception. All right, so if you've got any questions, throw it in there and we will do our best. We'll do our best to bring that question into play. Now, we have also been asking for you guys to send in some of your questions for tonight's special guest, and those have been coming in. Thank you very much for those. Uh, So, we do have a bit of a play. But in the meantime, bringing on to the stage now is the man of the hour. We want to just have a real big props up for the man. This is Craig Lord. Craig Lord, welcome to the stage. Yay. Good evening, everyone. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Hey, Craig, it's so so awesome for you to be here. We thank you so much. We want to start off in the proper way and the the, the appropriate way that we do on Talano Sa'o, and that's with a bit of prayer. So, for we have, do you think you could just start us off with a bit of a, a prayer for us? Sure, why not? Awesome. Let us pray. Our Father God, we just want to praise and glorify your wonderful name. We want to say thank you so much for bringing us all together, especially with our special guest, um, Craig. Lord, we Thank you because you are with me during the time that I was away. Thank you for being with those um, who were on the program constantly, my dear brother Elliot and sister Leal. Lord, I ask that you just bless the audience who have been faithful in listening all these many episodes. And uh, Lord, tonight I just ask for a special blessing on my brother Craig, and I ask that you just allow him to be able to answer all the questions that are going to be given to him tonight. (laughs) And we just thank you, Lord, for being with us, and we ask this in the mighty name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Oh, oh, Leo kept it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maybe oh. rebooting the router, right? Eh? Ray yeah. rebooting the, the router. All right. So it looks like we've already got some wonderful comments coming in here. We've got uh, Jenny, greetings, beautiful, fierce people. Tina, uh, evening all. Kate's hey, in Tina. there. Hi, Kate. Hi, yeah, Kate. Kate, thank you. Chase, Chase is in there. All right. Oh, oh Toby. Toby's put in a, <laughs> a go, go home, if it's all. Okay. Mm. <laughs> hey. All right. Good of you. Tauranga. Very good. So. Uh, we've got we've got a lot of more comments in here. Oi! We've even got a few here for for Craig as well. Annette's going in there uh, as well. Yeah, and it's uh, and Barbara Craig for oh, Mia. Yeah. Awesome. All right, and uh, you yes. got Mia. So we've even got some of our people on YouTube even thrown in there as well. Good to see you, Craig. Ah, awesome, awesome, very good. Okay, so we'll wait for uh, for until Liao gets in, Craig. Could you please start off just by giving us a, a little bit of an intro to yourself, to our people, those of us who don't know you too well, uh, and just a, a brief bio, if you could. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's uh, trying to make a brief is the problem. Um, so I, <laughs> I, basically, I moved to Auckland when I was 15 years old. I, I came up here by myself. I'd applied for a job in the back of the Herald, and in those days there was no internet and no cell phone, so ads were in the Herald. And it was simply saying school lever wanted for a small engineering workshop. So I rang the phone number. They said, sure, come in for an interview. I said, well, I can't do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. So I hopped on the motorbike, 
rode all the way up to Auckland, found the workshop eventually with a map uh, taped to the fuel tank of my motorbike, at paper maps in those days, of course. And they gave me the job that afternoon. So I rang my father and said, I'm leaving home. I'm moving to Auckland. So that's where I've been for 35 years. Um, I stayed with that workshop for 16 years. I ended up being trained as a maintenance and diagnostics engineer, uh, specializing in hydraulic and pneumatic automation. And really my the core machinery I used to repair was was injection molding machines, factory production lines, things like that to keep the keep those factory products pumping out all day every day. That was that was my main thing. So I did that, and in that time, uh, I met my wife. So I met her when I was uh, I think I was seventeen, and she was fifteen. So I'd only been up here for two years. Uh, we met then, so that was thirty whatever years ago. Um, we've been married 26 years. Uh, our son is turning 21 next month. Our daughter turns 25 at the end of the year. Uh, but I stayed in that hide. That's that's that side of it. But I stayed in the the engineering for 16 years, and in that time they trained me up through all the aspects of business, and including that was stints as the sales manager, workshop manager, and then general manager. They wanted me to buy the company. They offered that. I, it didn't pan out. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So I left. And well, yeah, it's an oddball thing to do. But I, I flicked the switch and I converted myself to being media freelance uh, chasing motorsport, which is, I mean, <laughs> from an engineer into motorsport and, and media, knowing zero about how it worked. I, I, I didn't know anything about um, media contracts, how to get the work, where the work was going to come from. But I had a hobby of photography. I liked writing and uh, I had a passion for motorsport. So I thought, well, surely I can make all three work together. And I did. And I'm still, I still have that business today, 20 years later. And uh, 20, oh, whatever it is. Uh, it's a while. And, and I still do motorsport work, uh, amongst other things. So also, I've had some really good fun uh, on the microphone at, at special events. So I've been the MC <laughs> for some major sporting events like the World Triathlon, International Ironman, World Rowing Cup. Um, uh, I think the biggest one was when I got to be an MC as part of the 2011 Rugby World Cup. That was pretty cool, and, and I enjoyed that. That was um, – it's a time you'll never forget. And every time either Tonga or Samoa – turned up to play the the party was insane because there is no <laughs> party like the pacifica parties there you go um the, yeah the irish were very close the irish were close <laughs> but not quite when it came to just good times no matter what the team was doing so so that was a highlight of my, my broadcasting career and i've had stints on radio sport <coughs> as a producer and a host and also on zb for a little while um doing talk back uh overnights and on weekends and, and short stints on, on Sky Sport and Prime. Um, but mostly it's it's all revolved sort of around, my, my media has revolved around sports, events, motorsport, <clears throat> and just, just things like that. And I've just kept doing it. So that's basically who I am. Oh, we've got, hmm. you know, the, the two dogs and, and six chickens. That's my world. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> That's really awesome. Awesome. Uh, so, okay, obviously, we've had people being uh, coming out, and, and I just want to address something that has been brought up. Just to let, you, let everyone know, there have been a couple of, of people who are mayoral candidates who have been putting out there that we didn't allow them to come on. Just to let you know, we never heard from those people. We sent out two messages, and they didn't come back to us. So I see some in there. I just want to put that out there that, that was there was no comms back the other way. We put out the comms. They didn't comms back. So just to, just to let you know that one. Uh, now, Craig, we've had Viv Beck out. We've had Leo Malloy out. We've now come down to the three. That is yourself, that's Fessel Collins, and, of course, Wayne Brown. Now, the, the, there is a big track, and as per usual for a New Zealand environment, there's a hefty push by mainstream media to say that, hey, we tell you what the polls are, therefore you'll follow that way. Now, I, are these, should we be listening to these polls? Because they seem to go all over the place. Uh, some have you high, some have you low, some have you mid. We don't know. What's up with these polls that, that you are aware of? 
Well, the polls to me are a difficult um, thing to do. I, I actually think that polls are bad for democracy because what happens with a poll is you create um, a, a news pattern for the mainstream media. They pick on that number that came from that poll and they don't research any further. So they don't look at any other candidates. They just pick usually, say, the top five on an, on a poll. And the poll isn't really, even though it's it's called scientific, but of course they'll say that, and the people who run them, of course, will say that. But at the end of the day, it, it's, it's not a democratic sort of solution to let the population know who is out there. And, <clears throat> excuse me, what they should do is simply do the research themselves and analyze and go, well, what are the policies of these different candidates? And, and then try and garner from there if they're worth covering or not. And that's a decision they eventually have to make because they just can't cover everyone. Hmm. But the problem you've got is it's such a tiny snippet of the population, really small. And we're talking the, the uh, average polls at the moment are 500 people. They did do a recent 1,000 poll. And that's out of 1.1 million eligible voters. So how do you use that as an accurate tool? You can't. So whilst it's ego boosting to have a good number on the poll, it's to me, it's not a real position of where the people sit. The other problem you have with polls and why I say they're undemocratic is because they create a sheeple effect. So what happens is you put out a poll and people then try to vote strategically. What is what what happened in the general election last time? People sort of analyze the polls and they go, oh, well, then I need to vote here to stop this happening. And it's a strategy rather than just saying to themselves, I'll vote for the person I want or the party I want or the people I want. They try and play strategy games and all it does is cause colossal problems. And it's not a true democracy because what they're doing is they're voting to keep people out rather than vote for the person they really want in, which is what democracy is meant to be. So that's why I have major issues with the polls. <clears throat> and the other issue I have, and it's I think it's a fair one, is the latest Courier poll was run by a person who endorsed one of the candidates and that ha candidate happened to get the highest number. So you've got to scratch your head. You've got to raise eyebrows and question it. And unfortunately, it's, that's the way it is. So, yeah, that's what the polls do to, to, a, to a campaign for anyone, whether it's central or local. The polls, to me, are a bit of an issue. Awesome, awesome. So let's get into some of our questions. Uh, for Yavai Liao, I know that you've got questions that uh, from yourselves as well as our people. Do one of you want to start off that little hitter? Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind asking Oi. the first question. Go for it. Okay. Um, so I have a question, and it says here, uh, clearly the lockdowns have negative effects both socially and economically. If we were to have another pandemic, what would you do differently to ensure that we don't repeat the same mistake again? Okay, uh, that's a reasonably good one, although it does encroach into central government issues because they are the ones who, who put on the lockdown. So if they were to, I don't think they would. I think it would be political suicide for another lockdown to happen. Um, but what I would have uh, strongly advocated for if I was mayor during those lockdowns was uh, not to force mandates. I do not believe in mandates. So I would have been making a bit of noise about that rather than just uh, jumping on the political uh, wagon of my puppeteer masters I would say what I felt <laughs> and the other thing is is not banning people who weren't vaccinated um, from council facilities because to me that was completely unfair if someone was uh, vaccinated and they had a fear of someone who wasn't vaccinated to me that doesn't add up you're vaccinated what are you scared of and also if you don't want to hang out with unvaccinated people you're welcome to stay at home and that's basically the message I would have said. It would have upset a lot of people, but I do tend to play a straight bat with my opinion. Um, the councillors may not have, have agreed with, with my stance at that, but that's what I believed in. So that's really, as a mayor, probably the only sort of input towards the lockdowns of COVID that, that, that any mayor could have, because really they're at the beckoning call of our, our central government. Mm, that's good. Thank awesome. You. Yeah, nice one. Uh, Fuyavai, do you have something there? Malo, Lava, Craig, I, I just wanted to 
to ask a question regarding uh, any strategy you might have in terms of dealing with the Pacifica vote, because um, as you know, Fessel Collins is running against, well, he's not running against you. He's running for mayor as well. And um, although he lives out in West Auckland, I, I met him the other day over at the Mangere market. And, you know, and I spoke with him. Um, basically, I shared with him uh, my concerns regarding uh, his stance, well, his party's stance on certain issues and how it would be difficult for me to actually support him in that. But I wanted to ask you, if you have any plans to try to um, uh, uh, reach out to uh, people in the in the Pacific community, and mm. if so, what is what is, what is your strategy? Look, it's it's been incredibly difficult uh, because to target who do you target and who do you go visit, and given that there's markets across the Auckland region every weekend, it's it's a pick and choose. So what I've done is instead of targeting specific groups inside Auckland, my policies, because my policies are very um, uh, equitable, they're for everybody, my policies actually are for the good of every citizen of the city, I haven't particularly targeted any group for the votes. Uh, doesn't mean I, I couldn't, and hey, if you want to, let's see, what's tomorrow, Saturday morning, I'm quite happy to turn up to the markets with one of you tomorrow morning if you want, I'll be there, and I'll walk beside you, um, but no, it's I, I haven't done it like that, um, because again, my policies are for everyone, and, and I've wanted to share that with as many people as I could uh, across the Auckland Isthmus, which is, uh, it's not easy to do. It, it takes some um, it takes some getting around, but hey, I'm I'm there I'm there tomorrow morning if you want me there. Oi 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 oi. Here's your challenge for you, Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, Craig, I do have one that was given to me by by a lot of our audience, and that is we're facing unprecedented levels, and it is unprecedented levels of of skyrocketing ram raids, gang violence, gang numbers, drug crime, violent crime, sexual assaults across the Auckland city, and that that is actually across even the you know even like Red Beach had some issues going on there the other day. I was reading, but you know so. Crime is a big one. It is a massive issue going on currently, and we know that there is a co that it's mostly from those young people, uh, or at least it's the increase is very specifically from the young people elements. We do know, of course, that they contact that there is connections with the adult gangs. That aside, how would you, as mayor, confront those levels of crime, and how would you help to bring them down? Okay. Well, f first of all. Uh, the council is not a security firm, and, the, and that needs to be said very clearly. Mm -hmm. The council's role is to provide core services to make the city function and allow the citizens to, to get around the city and use the city for their livelihoods. The central government, it's their role to police and prevent crime for whatever aspect they can do it from. Now, that's a social issue, and, and as you explained in, in the question, crime is a social issue it's it's not a it's not a machine or anything it's it's a social thing so where can council uh help well first it's got to be very very loud at government it's got to lobby it's got to advocate and it's got to make a heck of a lot of noise and i've heard nothing from our current mayor about this and there should be a press conferences every week there should be press releases going out and the mayor should be chastising the government saying you are not doing your job but that won't happen under the phil goff regime and i know it won't happen under the efeso regime because if labor stay in power efeso will have to um, adhere to them and he won't go against it so i will and i'll make a heck of, I, look my wife will, will admit i'm a very annoying person and i will be annoying <laughs> to government they will be ah oh, here he goes ringing again the advantage you have as the mayor of auckland it's an incredibly powerful office they can't ignore the phone calls and the emails and the communication if any of us were to try and get hold of of the government ministers or the government itself we'd have no chance we get fobbed off all the time but as mayor i can do it for the people so that's the first part of it but what can council do inside its own city it's a good question a lot of crime is happening because uh, kids are bored and they're looking for a different lifestyle. We all know that, that, that poverty is, is the major cause. 
housing is a problem because that's a, a pro cause of pro poverty as well. But the council can only do so much in regards to housing. But what it can do is try its best to provide a core, a particular core service, which is its duty to the community, which is the facilities, sports and recreation, things to do, things to keep our youth entertained as long as they're within the council purview and budgets. And that's a lot of that's up to the community quite often to come back to council through the local boards or or specific community groups and saying, you know, we don't have basketball courts in our area. Now, let's pick on South Auckland, for example, just as one example. But it's the same west, the same north. It's limited in what there is. There should be basketball courts everywhere. There should be skateboard parks. Uh, there should be uh, playgrounds for the really young, of course, but they're not the ones in the crime problem at the moment. And the sporting facilities should be available because sport keeps you out of court. Well, most of the time. Uh, so we've got to improve what we do with working with those sporting groups. And that's where the council can come into play. But to me, that's the limit of its social side. Because again, to me, government is meant to be our social provider and our services provider of police, fire, schools, ambulance and hospitals. Hmm. Um, and, and so that's their job. That's government's job. And if government aren't providing it, if government isn't doing their job, council should be saying to the government, why not? do your job you're meant to be providing for our citizens the Aucklanders so that's really where I'm at with it um, in regards to businesses though businesses can obviously do their own security and they they should be looking after their council shouldn't be paying for any security for a business because that's not fair because who do you choose where, where where you give money to to beef up their business so you can't do that but what you can do is speed up the process for any business that wants to look at security that requires consents, that could be uh, bollards. There's a perfect example. So if a store wanted to put bollards in front of its shop, it can't just do it. It's got to ask for permission. It's got to find out where it can do, what it can do, how it can do it. A lot of that is Auckland Transport because it's the footpath and the roading. But what council should be doing is as soon as a shop gets in touch, there should be a department there for security right now and the shop gets in hold of them and they go we're on our way they go out there and they immediately say to the shop yes you can here's the plans you can put a bollard on the street here you're not going to cause problems for delivery for access of disabled for other other uh, functions you can do it there there's no underground services you're fine you're not going to rupture a gas line or the the fiber for the internet um, look here's the fee for our time two hundred dollars not thousands uh, go for it. But these are the spec. You can't change it from the spec. Here's what you can do outside your store in the suburb on this footpath for this particular shop. <clears throat> the problem is all shops will be different and underground will be different and the requirements of, of access will be different. But there is, just, just for me to end it, another issue that people have to be aware of for shops. If they want to put bollards in and they dig up the footpath and they put in bollards, if something has to be worked on uh, for the street and those bollards have to be ripped up, who pays for it to be reinstated? You know, mm. so there's there's lots of things to think about, if, especially if it's thousands and thousands of dollars um, and the council has to put in a new water main or something and they've got to rip the bollards up. Well, now the big question is who's paying for that? So there's a few things to do, but I hope I, it was a long winded question, but it's a it's a long answer. And but I hope it explained my position on it. No, that's good. And actually, I, I want to say that that's actually a, a fair question because I have heard from a couple of the other mayoral candidates who throw out these wild claims that they'll be able to fix elements of the social structure that does that does foundation of the crime. So I, I like that you actually put that line in there and say, well, that's actually not our job. Because you're right, that is not your job. And when we look overseas as well as in New Zealand data, it really is. It's not the job of the local council, but those no, who actually no. have the laws of the social effects on the family and the economy around it. So, no, well said, and, well and said. Even, even community groups, like like local community groups might want to look after their own youth and run youth programs and stuff. That's not actually a council role either. That's the community doing what they should be doing as a community. Um, they, they're a family and that's their job. Now, the council could help out and say, well, look, you haven't got a really good haul out this area. So, 
we have to look at providing a, a council facility for you to use or a hall or we can help you out. And that sort of thing is what the council can do. So, uh, so just sorry, just uh, sorry, guys, just to pierce on that a little bit. If you were the mayor, would you make it a, a, a little bit easier? So, currently, for example, the council venues are half price, half cost. If you are engaging in a political discourse or discussion, would you make it a little bit easier in the same in, a, in the same type of area for a council owned venue to be utilised for perhaps something which is youth based or something which is able to be identified as a prevention or intervention method for the reduction in crime yes 100 percent. that's that's what the council should be doing that that they can step in and help with if, cool. if a community group wants to use a community hall and the community hall says oh look it's 500 dollars to rent it for the day and the community group goes well come on we're, we're, we're trying to help out the kids here we don't have that money um the council should be going actually i see what you're doing here you're right put a line through it there's no fee mm. let's get on with it use the hall you know? okay so awesome. uh, they... there's certain there's certain caveats and exemptions that should be in place for things like that yeah no awesome awesome thank you very much liao i have another couple of questions but i'll just ask this one um how will auckland city get out of debt left behind by the previous mayor well the debt <laughs> itself <laughs> yeah yeah left behind by the previous mayor <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, it's a massive debt, and it's only going to go up at the moment. Uh, the CRL, that's that Central Rail Link, is going to increase it, and so will some other infrastructure projects. The, the, the thankful part of it is that we have a very good uh, debt rating with Standard & Poor's. So that's, that's a phew, thank goodness we've got that, if we're, we're not in trouble, trouble. What we've got to do is like any household budget or even any business budget if you know you've got a debt you go how am i going to service this debt i need more income or less expenditure so for me i'm going for the less expenditure route that's my first point of call so i want to change and overhaul the way council spends its money and, and i've got various ways that i want to achieve that there are big ticket items and to be fair uh, Desley Simpson, the councillor and her finance committee have done a very good job with some of the big ticket items, reducing the money down. And I think so far they've saved about $2.4 billion on expenditure, which is, that is fantastic and should be applauded. But speaking with her about this a couple of times, she said there's a lot more that can be done. And that, that was heartening for me. That's like, yes, if we can do that, if we can save hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars then we can service that debt and start to bring it down. Mm. And and we've just got to be in the future a lot smarter about how we do projects so we don't have to borrow <clears throat> so much for the future. Because, look, let, let me delve into one of those just quickly. So I want to overhaul the preferred contractor system. And the preferred contractor system is where we hemorrhage so much money. That is where, that is the, the function of the city to keep it maintained and keep it operating is using those contractors. We've got to change the way that works so we're not shelling out millions and millions and millions of dollars for projects that should only be 100000 or where we're shelling out $1 million for a project that should be 100000 or even $50,000 for a $10,000 job. When you add all those up, when you take in the really old adage of if you look after the pennies, the pounds take care of themselves, if you bring that into play, suddenly we change the way the budget works inside council. So so that's what I'm, I'm about. I'm about pulling the purse strings in, focusing on the necessities, not the niceties, uh, making sure we are legitimate in our costings and that we're not getting rorted and, and ripped off in our projects and just and being and focusing on the expenditure rather than the income so that we can get that debt down and let's get that debt mm. under control because it is in the tens of millions and it's got to come down. Um, but yeah, again, it's a phew, we, we're, we're currently okay, but ooh, we're, we're on the cusp. Yep. No, awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Great one. If we have, did you have something there? Yeah. Once again, um, I'm, I'm just speaking from, a, um, the perspective of someone from the Pacific community. 
And the reason why I, I want to address this is because, of course, this is a program that that is uh, called Talano Asao, and we'll be talking about issues, or we should have issues that have to, more to do with our community than you would find in in other um, talk shows or mm-hmm. or uh, mm-hmm. web podcasts that you might might actually come across. So, um, one thing I wanted to say is that I've, I've come across this uh, information that talked about the fact that. <clears throat> The second most uh, spoken language here in Auckland happens to be Samoan. And that's this is the only place in the entire country where it's like that. Because everywhere else in the country, uh, the first language is English and the second language is Te Reo, Maori. But in Auckland, the second most spoken language happens to be Samoan. The third most spoken language is Te Reo, Maori. Here in, and it's only in Auckland. So coming from that perspective, I, I, I wanted to, I, I've heard what you've had to say about, about um, uh, different uh, ways of, of dealing with, with issues that uh, were, were probably brought about because of uh, former administrations. Uh, one of those uh, things that have to, that have a really big impact on the Pacific community is that of uh, welfare. Uh, the law of unintended consequences. Uh, this, these uh, prior administrations felt like uh, the the way to solve so many problems was throwing money at the problem, and um, and then trying to to make uh, you know use that money and trying to resolve whatever the problems were, and the unintended consequence was actually. Uh, creating a uh, a larger welfare system where people were actually dependent on the government. And so because we've uh, created that as an issue, and it's, it's, it's a really big issue here in the, in the Pacific community, I'm wondering if you have a way of resolving that, if, you, if you've got like some way of taking steps toward trying to um, resolve this particular uh, problem within the, uh, um, not just the Pacific community, but other communities as well. But uh, because of the fact that there's so many in, in number here, uh, this is why I'm bringing it up. Awesome. Welfare dependency. Yes. Mm. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, your question was too scary. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There, oh. there we go. <laughs> there we go. Wow. It, in fact, the phone is meant to um, silence phone calls, but it obviously didn't there. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, that's an interesting one. We are, we have turned ourselves into a a welfare state Um, but New Zealand is meant to be a welfare state but yeah welfare dependency and that's a a major problem it really again comes from I think uh, poor social um, issues from the government they haven't done it right that argument will go on forever between, between the different parties and what what can be done? Well, probably from a council point of view, probably not a lot, which is, and, and it's not a question I've ever had before. So I'm trying to think on the fly here, but I, I'm not sure the council can do anything. The only thing straight away I could suggest that might help that rut of welfare dependency and, and the possibility of, of turning it around over time is the local contractor system that I'm, I'm proposing. And, and the reason I say that is I was at a debate at uh, Wātea Marae and one of the questions was, the big contractors get all the work and our small business, and he said Pacifica and Māori businesses, we're getting none of that. And, and that was great to my ears because I said, well, have I got the policy for you? <clears throat> and this could be it as well because... By overhauling the preferred contractor system, this will allow local businesses to work local. And now local businesses can get themselves into the system. And so now they'll need more workers and they'll need more staff. And so they'll be advertising, hey, we need people who want to do it. And it could be um, from the most simplistic tasks of, of, of beach cleaning or, or park maintenance public facility maintenance, whatever the role is that the council requires in that area, 
<clears throat> we'll find local contractors who, who can do it. And there'll be businesses, and, and his ears pricked up at that meeting. He goes, yeah. I said, well, there'll be businesses who might only be a one or two person operation. And they'll be going, well, hang on. If I can get this council work and I can look after my own region, and let's just let's just say Altara for, for the want of a, a suburb. These contractors can go, well, we know how to do concrete work. We know how to repair fences. We know how to do plumbing. We've got electricians. We've got roofers. We've got all this. We can create a company and we can put in a proposal and we can be in the contract system. And now we're working for the council. So the council's creating jobs. If we create jobs, we're starting to get rid of that welfare dependency mentality. I mean, it's not the overall fix because it's not like we're going to create tens of thousands of jobs. Hmm. But if we can start it, and and get the process rolling and be a part of it then then i'd be happy to do that and one of the aspects that really uh, makes me excited about having local contractors working local is the pride because if a local contractor is repairing their own area they're going to have a huge amount of pride in their work and they're going to want to go to work and they're going to want to serve the community and they're going to want to get more work because they know they've done a good job in the previous tasks they were given. So to me, it's a really cool snowball effect. It, it, it grows everything. And then hopefully other businesses will go, well, actually, I want a piece of that pie. I'll, I'm going to set up as well, and I'm going to put up my hand. And, and you could end up with like, who cares if we end up with 50 businesses or 50 companies who have started up to, to work for the council as their own little entity? Because now they might be able to pick up other businesses as well, because we've helped them grow. And there's all these little side aspects to it that, that for me, are kind of exciting. Um, but to, to answer that question, that's probably about the limit of where council could, and get in, could get involved with the welfare dependency. But on your first point about the languages, I'm actually surprised that the Asian languages aren't up there amongst that. But that could be because there's so many of them that it, that it splits that, um, that percentage of being the most spoken uh, language in, in Auckland. I'm sure. Yeah, I thought well, Cantonese was up there uh, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised, mm. but but anyway, I, I I don't know if that fully answered the question or, or satisfied you, but that's really off the fly what I can offer. Mm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. No, thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, so I want to bring up a couple of comments here that have been brought up for for the question that I've been asked to to send along. That is this one from ABCZX One. Is cycleways, wee <laughs> All right, so we've got cycleways there, and then along down along here, we've also got Amanda. She is talking about what will happen to Hill Street in Walkworth. I think most of us do know. I'm assuming she means the one that goes down the hill and up, and then any type of uh, any type of any day off, it turns into this massive snake of yeah. Okay, I think we all know what we're talking about there. <laughs> yeah, good. So okay. so Craig, that that, and also. Even on that, I'd, I would love for your, I'd like your take on traffic overall. How do we prevent it? Are these bus lanes the funded or the, the, the ratepayer funded public transport, the CRL, the light rail, that big okay. fat fish? Okay, the fat fish. Right, we'll start with cycleways. So cycleways uh, can be a good thing. I, I got no problem with cycleways, but they're putting them in the wrong place and they're putting them in too expensive. So a lot of the times they're putting in cycleways that are just not being used. And the rhetoric of the narrative is, if we build it, they'll get used. Well, unfortunately, that's already proving to be incorrect. So there's an ideology that's not quite adding up there. The Aucklanders, cycles are less than 1% of Auckland. They're a very loud minority, and they're welcome to ride a push bike. I, I've got no problem with that. And I do feel for, for the, I think we've had two cyclists who have been killed very recently, and that's an absolute tragedy. But uh, people, you know, it's, it's you can't protect everyone with everything all the time, sadly. We'd love to, but we can't do that. Um, a, a lot of these cycleways are, are proving to be a bit nonsensical. I would like to uh, have them a bit smarter, and there's a lot of places where footpaths are actually adequate for cycle lanes and what frustrates me is uh, is tamaki drive for example where they have used half the footpath for cycle lanes and you go there and the cyclists are in the middle of the road lane because they don't want to use the cycle lane and so that frustrates me and it probably 
frustrates the majority of Aucklanders as well, that you provide them with something and they won't use it. And then if you don't provide them, they moan about it. So in regards to are we, have we got the, the quota just right? No, we've, we've kind of, there's no problem with more cycle lanes, just not on the main arterials. That's where I find it to be quite an issue. <clears throat> uh, Hill Street, I oh, yeah, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. That has well, what a nightmare. And I think they've, I as far as I'm aware, the government or NZTA have said, yep, we're on it. We're 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 back in planning mode. So I'm going to chase it up. Um, it has to be pushed. There's about five on my list. There's Mill Road as well in the Bombay Hills, particularly with the bridge and the count, uh, the BP. The other gas stations, the off ramps, on ramps. Um, there's Glenvar Road up in North Shore. That's an absolute disaster. It's an it, well, I was going to say it's an accident waiting to happen, but accidents happen and they keep putting mm. it off. So there's some roading projects that are a must. The the Hill Street one in Walkworth that slows up almost the nation. It, it's it's ridiculous that that wasn't prioritised. Instead, they're putting priority on putting a light rail down Dominion Road. I just don't understand the mentality when all those billions are there, they're saying the money is there. Well, get into Hill Road and sort it out now. Do that. That's way more important. But unfortunately, the ideology of those on the left at the moment is no, no, no. We, we don't focus on roads. We focus on cycle lanes and on, on trams. And then going into your one about public transport and, and I assume road congestion was what you were <clears throat> speaking of. So I've got a major problem with what NZTA and Auckland Transport are doing. They are creating congestion on purpose. I find that to be abhorrent. I, I, I think it's... Um, oh, that's it's right. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's disgraceful what they are doing. They are taking away free left turns. They are putting in speed humps where they don't belong. I've got no problem with speed humps in certain areas. They they do work for safety when required. But when they're purely there just to, to, to frustrate and slow down traffic for no reason, that's where I have a major issue. They have put in uh, traffic islands to reduce multiple lanes down into dual or single lanes, then open them back up again. They're putting in uh, anything they can to restrict traffic. And they're doing it on purpose, and it's to cause congestion. They've admitted it. Uh, the, the the cycle advocates have admitted it. Greater Auckland, who is a cycle activist, public transport activist, he's admitted that's what they are doing on purpose. And thankfully, uh, Ludo Campbell Reid, who no longer is part of Auckland Council, he's over destroying Melbourne now. He admitted it as well that. He said, if what you do for social engineering is you don't hit people with everything at once because then they will fight against you and rally against you. What you do is you take away what people want and put in what you want little bits at a time. They might complain about it for a little while. You can tell them it's a trial, but after a while they forget about it and they just carry on and put up with it. That's the admittance that was done. And I just, that they have to be kicked to touch. Anyone with that kind of mentality in Auckland Transport, and there's a lot of them, need to go. Thankfully, there are tools to do that. The mayor has the power with the committees that under the council table to actually fire the Auckland Transport Board. They have the power, the mayor has the power to uh, create the statement of intent with that committee and the councillors. They have a review of the CEO and they have the power in legislation, which I've been reading up on, and it's not easy, but it's there. They have the power to control what the CCOs, of which Auckland Transport is one of them, actually do, their, their job. They have the power to do that. <clears throat> this current mayor doesn't do it. Uh, that particular committee is called the Appointments Performance Review Committee. They have the power over the CCOs. It's chaired by Mayor Goff. It has six of his left-leaning minion councillors on there, and poor old Christine Fletcher is left on her own as the deputy chair with no power, basically. And also Phil Goff took, took two councillors off Auckland Transport's board. They had voting rights. He removed them. I'll be putting them back on, and I'll be changing that committee to be councillors, and I don't care if they're from the left or the right, but they'll be councillors after an interview with me that I am sure they have the best interests of Aucklanders in their hearts and minds. That's what, mm. how they will get on that committee and that they understand that what they are doing to Auckland, slowing Auckland down is a hindrance. 
it is it is it is causing congestion it's causing emissions it's causing costs to businesses it has to be removed um and for, oh, finally on the buses <clears throat> the biggest problem we have in auckland in my opinion and i'm happy to be proven wrong but in my opinion auckland topography the layout of auckland and the way that it's been designed across the suburbs for the last 180 years how we've built it does not lend itself to public transport mayor robbie tried to get it to happen in the 70s he got shot down and unfortunately because he had the right ideas back then and now it's too late to to put in effective public transport and and i'll get to that little point shortly there's only three options the first option will never happen because we cannot afford it and i i just don't think it's feasible is tunneling suburbs subways everywhere it'll never happen the second option and i hope this doesn't happen as well is to enforce a scorched earth policy to bring in an effective loop system where where public mass transport is available to everyone effectively and efficiently you've got to remove so many houses and buildings around auckland to put it in that that is not feasible either <clears throat> the third option which i think is feasible with the modern technology that's available is go above ground it gets laughed at and scoffed at a little bit but i think people need to realize that it works overseas and possibly it's something we should be looking at here out of the box we go up with with the big pylons and we have an above ground loop system which then we can put it anywhere we can put it down the side or center of a motorway we can run it above suburbs we can we can we can go across the hilly terrain with a nice flat system have these these depots everywhere the under rail the under rail monorail it's similar system but that's really old school they're, they're electric now they're pneumatic they're magnetic there's all sorts of designs. no I, I love them i think that is the greatest yeah. idea and that well, the, 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 the budget fixes well, it one of the really cool things i saw overseas was they use parking towers for car parking and that train goes into it in an upper level and mm. there's lifts so it's for the disabled the cyclists they can ride to it they can the disabled it can park right there they can jump on the lift go to the level of the train and hop on that train and go to where you want to go and then come back to your car later it's right there and it's part of the tower it's part of the system so <clears throat> it exists we just uh, are not broad enough in our in our thinking for that so that's the thing and just just the last little bit on transport and and i'm going to pick on a feso here because he has his major policy and i'm surprised this is a major policy is freeze is fee is free there is no such thing as free we are yep. all going to be paying for it one way or the other he has said he isn't sure where the money is going to come from, and it's anywhere from 250 to $500 million per year. At this stage, he's saying, I'm going to take money from one of the other budgets. Well, what's going to happen to whatever budget that was for? And it's just taking out of one pocket and putting in another. And to me, that's not right. And if he can't do that, the only other way he can follow through with his promise is to up the rates to cover that with a targeted system. So I do not agree with uh free fares and in, in, in an aspect there however i don't mind having a subsidy and i'm pretty sure the population wouldn't mind either subsidizing the elderly uh the card holders who who need it uh, helping the disabled students obviously uh there's places for that and 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 the population could be yeah we're for that but everybody and anybody that that doesn't fly with me and the survey i did and everyone pulls up their surveys but the survey i did of 1200 uh, i think it was only around 200 people said they'd be interested in a reduced priced fare but that wasn't the reason they don't take public transport the reason is it's ineffective and it's inefficient that was the reason hmm awesome oh no look thank you so much for that i think that's yeah that's some really great stuff and and just to let you know for our audience out there just to let you know what craig was talking about earlier on was that it, had, it was advised, it wasn't even admitted, it was advised that the New Zealand traffic management, over, the overall management system for Auckland traffic, is to make it harder to travel. They admitted this, they, they stated it very clearly, that their job, that they actually were on purpose slowing us down, they were on purpose jamming up the traffic. This is not some 
out there, and I was listening to several interviews on ZB, uh, it, it was quite a, it was shocking to hear them actually be very clean about it. That is exactly what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, look, thank you so much for that. I think that that's some great stuff there. Liao, what question do you have for us? Craig, it's been so good to hear. Um, I just have one of my own because I know for a fact that in, in town uh, with the homelessness, that, that they're still paying, what, a million dollars a day to house them in these, you know, you look at that and you go, what an incredible waste of money that they have not even, you know, Carmel Cipollone, social development, have not even addressed, you know, you as the mayor will be able to take back what actually belongs to our city and to start, will you have the power to be able to go, okay, we need to address this because all we're doing is hiding problems. We're not actually dealing with yeah. them at any, with any scope of imagination that we're spending this much money. It's like turning on the tap of all of our rates and letting this drain out. Yeah. I, I'm not an expert on, on the homeless or the social services side of things. So, so one of the actual jobs of a mayor, uh, because then the mayor isn't the boss, the mayor's a leader, is to have a team around you. So I'm going to have to get in the experts who know about the homeless, who, who, who live and breathe it every day. And I need those people around me to guide me on what to do. In regards though to how the government have handled it, yes, that's again the lobbying job, the advocating job of a mayor to council and say, or to government to say, sorry, but, but you're actually causing problems in our city and we're going to have to correct these now because we've got to put our foot down and do that. What they've done with the emergency housing down in the CBD is a disaster. And it is, as you say, it's out of sight, out of mind to them. There was a, a I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago, and one of the big problems we've got is where do they go? And <laughs> wherever they are housed, there's going to be issues. So that's a major discussion that has to happen in the communities because, well, you, you know what is going to happen. If, if a, a Kainga Aura uh, division is, is created somewhere, wherever's next door are going to be saying, I don't want that. It's, it's the ultimate NIMBY, isn't it? Not in my backyard. Arguably, they can do that. They can say, I don't want it, and, and the fights are going to start. So there's a lot to, to pick through on it. But yes, they have caused major problems in the CBD, and they do need to be solved. And... I will be working extremely hard to do so because the, one of the reasons is I want to completely refresh the CBD and, I, and I've got a, a well, I don't know if it's a wild idea or whether it's a mishmash of, of lots of people's different ideas, but I think we need to flick the switch, call it a CCD. So it's a central civic district, not a business district. Whilst there are businesses that do have to stay together, say lawyers, finance firms, accountants, banks, those sort of things, they need that direct interaction. They, they don't actually use a lot of paperwork anymore, but it's that direct interaction. A lot of the businesses proved during COVID that they don't need to be in the CBD. They can operate in satellite offices anywhere. They can set up anywhere around uh, Auckland City. So we, we got the, we'll then have empty retail and empty business. So what do you do with the CBD? We turn into the CCD and you turn it into a family-centric park. The whole lower Queen Street, that area down by the silos, the waterfront, forget about the ports, let the ports be the ports, but all that other area, you turn it into something special, a destination, because that is what Queen Street used to be. 20 plus years ago, before, well, maybe slightly more, but it, still even 20 plus years ago, Queen Street was, oh, let's go shopping, where should we go? We'll go to Queen Street. It, it was an adventure. It was, it was something to do. Now it's, uh, do you want to go somewhere different? We'll go to Albany. Oh, no, we'll go to St. Luke's. Oh, how about we go to Botany? Now it's the malls are our destination mm. for shopping. <clears throat> so you don't shop in the Queen Street anymore. So you've got to do something else with it. I think apartment buildings are a great idea, and the council has to help the building owners with a quick fire way of turning their old retail stores and their businesses into apartment blocks for accommodation and the students will use them people will flock to go you know bulk they love that it's a lot of people who love that idea 
especially yeah. suddenly if we've got a pedestrianised Lower Queen Street, because you don't need your car because you're not going shopping there, you have the shops that the malls don't have. You still need the shops to service that community that live there by default, but they've just built a brand new mall down the bottom of Queen Street anyway. So you still need the, the convenience stores and clothing stores and a few retail. But imagine the shops you don't have, those boutique shops, the specialist shops that have cool things and art and just stuff that you don't regularly get. And you have more cafes and restaurants and and, and you could have museums and, and just the things for kids to do. And, and, and you turn it into something different. Then suddenly we've got a different CBD, but it's that homeless one that you were talking about at the very beginning. How do we remove them from there? That's a big problem that I do not have an answer for, and I need that help. So when I'm mayor, if any of the listeners here are specialists in dealing with that social side of life, you have to get hold of me. You have to get in touch because I'll need you on the team. That's that's the only way we're going to do this, and it's going to cool. take more than well, we might know someone. Experts. <laughs> yep, it's going to take a handful of people who have to get in there and say, I'm in. How, how can I help you? And, and that's what mm. we've got to do. Awesome. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for that. Fuyabo, we've got, we've got a few questions. We've got only barely about the uh, four questions left. But okay, I'll try thank and you so much, my Craig. as well. Yeah, you're, gonna... <laughs> you're doing really well, Good Craig. You. Well you're doing done. well. You're doing well. Uh, thanks for, for answering the question so far, Craig. Um, great job, uh, as, as these guys have said. I'm uh, going to continue with the Pacific thing. Um, the reason why I'm bringing these things up is because I'm very familiar with these things, being as I'm based here, and I also ran for um, a, a representative in this area. So um, one of the biggest problems that we have in Pacifica in the community happens to be gambling. And um, because of the gambling problems that uh, the people in the Pacifica community have, uh, they've, they've come to the realization uh, that <clears throat> the gambling industry is making so much money um, from low socioeconomic people, <clears throat> low socioeconomic communities, uh, specifically in the areas of uh, Papatoe, Otara, Orahu, and um, par parts of Monaco, you'll find the, the, the main thing is it's not the casinos for them. It's actually pokey machines that are in each of these different yeah. establishments, almost on, on, on in every corner. And um, the thing that, that, that uh, I guess I'm bringing this up right now, just because it's a, it's a two part of my question. The first thing I wanted to say is if you were aware of this, and uh, you were talking about trying to get money into the communities, and you talked about like your solution uh, that you had, that, that you had brought up, and um, you know I think that's a great idea, uh, hiring um, jobs within the community. I I, I wanted to, to, to just uh, bring up the first thing if you were aware of this issue, yes, what your uh, solution would be regarding that. Uh, the, the second thing would be. Um, People are complaining in the Pacific community because what's happening is that they, they um, especially here in the South Auckland, because they don't feel like uh, they're getting the kind of uh, financial assistance from the government that they uh, were receiving prior to uh, Auckland becoming a super city. And so I'm just wondering uh, if we're talking about bringing money back into the community. Yes. Uh, if you were to split south auckland away from this major major uh, area because uh one of the things that we're finding inside the problem gambling thing is that all this money is being spent by these people uh you know statistics show that that uh pacifica and maori are, are like the number one number two in in, in uh population size regarding uh gambling yes. and um so they spend all this money that they don't have yes and um then uh, what happens is that money, because it's a super city, that money gets put into a pot that goes to like another area, yes. like Wemwera, for example, or yes. some of those other areas. And meantime, this money came out of this small community over here, but it's not yep. being used within okay. that community. It's being yep. taken to another part of Auckland. And that's because yep. uh, the, the problem that we're talking about regarding a super city as opposed to just yep. it being like um, Monaco 
or um, something like that, the way it used to be. I know, I know what you what you're getting at here. So, uh, well, first of all, the pokies. I, I think gambling is a is a terrible drug. It's a disease, and I and I, I despise it. I don't even do anything a tipple on the TAB. I, I I just think it's a terrible thing. The pokies, if I have the power to do so, I'm not sure that I would. I would remove them. I, I just think they're a blight on society. Now, what they do is they say, these people who run them, oh, but we give back to the community. We put the money into sports. And if it wasn't for us, they would that, that team wouldn't have a uniform. Or if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't have a, a, new, a new set of nets for their um, basketball court or things like that. They wouldn't be able to get... Uh, we help to send them to um, Waikato to take on another team. They do this kind of stuff. So... <clears throat> it's like the licensing trusts with alcohol. They do the same thing. They market themselves very cleverly to the community saying, uh, look, we're going to give you a free fire extinguisher and we're going to give you a free first aid kit and, and a smoke alarm. Look at us. How wonderful are we? Just keep buying alcohol from our stores and we'll we'll do this for the community. It's a rort and they're making a lot of money in the background uh, and, and people are suffering. So, yes, I, I despise the pokies. I don't know if I've got the power to remove them. I do know it's a major problem, and we need to re reduce them dramatically uh, for the better of society. And I will be, uh, because I know it exists, I'll be certainly knocking on the doors inside council to find out what we can and can't do. So definitely I'll be looking at that. Um, in regards to what I think you were getting at is equity, which is more the return on the rates, and that is a major problem. Uh, and, and that can be seen instantly when you drive through South Auckland and you look at their playgrounds and you go, hang on a second. Why is this a $5,000 playground and there's a, a $200,000 one in Remuera or, or somewhere else? The argument from those areas are they, they'll say, but we pay more in rates, so we should have more in our area. Well, yeah, it's an argument. It's an argument. Um, but I don't think... Even though we shouldn't be, say, taking all the money out of uh, Oraki or wherever and putting it somewhere else, because it's their money and their region, I think it needs to be looked at, is it, what you're saying, going fairly back to the community? Rodney District and Franklin District are pure examples of that. They pay so much in rates <coughs> with their rural properties, they don't get the services that we do in urban. So they're paying for things that they're not receiving. And it is the same, yes, in South Auckland and certainly way out west as well. They pay rates. And when you look at what they're getting, I think it's I think it's uh, Herald Island. They don't even have footpaths. <laughs> you know? And they're paying rates. It's yeah. like, come on, what's going on here? So um, I think we need to rethink the way it's it's worked. One of the one of the things I'm I'm very strong on is 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 reworking the equation for rates but that's another issue i want to get some really smart accountants and to come up with better ideas on how we can fairly charge people the rates on their property because it's made up of those of the, the 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 uniform rate which everyone pays per property and then your general rate and then your targeted rate for certain things <clears throat> but it needs a recalculation because it, it just doesn't seem right and i'll need the financial gurus to to come up with that but we've got to get equity back into play. So we'll put in the simple numbers. If South Auckland's producing $100 million, then they should be getting $100 million, or at least 80 or 90 million, knowing that, yeah, they have to pay their share for other stuff as well, like everybody does. That might not be the exact percentages, but you get what I'm, what I'm saying here. Um, it's just a fairness thing, and, and you're right. The Super City, <coughs> excuse me, the Super City has created a problem. I'm going to... And pop a cough lozenge <laughs> while I'm talking because yeah, good idea. <coughs> two months of talking but equity is not equity at the moment hmm. uh, Craig the yeah I I think that's a, actually a really good <coughs> comment uh, so I'll chat while you're coughing cough cough you know sometimes you've got to cough to get I'm it good. out so that's I'm all good, good hood uh, the it is quite interesting how you talk about the rates because I think you know when when the landlords get pumped themselves, they get regulated and then they've got to, their costs go up. I think it absolutely makes sense for them to pass on those increases to those who they rent to. I think it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's unfair that they've got that 
right? But it is a brutal type of fairness that they pass on that to those who are renting. It's a horrible yeah. sort of system. And obviously that goes all the way, mm-hmm. again, back to national government. The, yeah. And then, of course, then you've got that argument which says, well, these the, this group, this region over here collects most of the more of the rates. But in actual fact, it's actually coming a bit more dispersed evenly because of the fact that those costs have been passed onto that other region so i i do i, I think the, i think you're right the equation needs to be looked at i remember seeing the equation some years ago and and it hurt my head the equation yeah, is, is yeah. oh yeah it's fascinating just to look at oh, it it's quite fascinating the way uh, they so, do it yeah yeah oh it's, it's incredible incredible yeah, yeah. So I've got, I've actually got a couple of questions, and but one of them is a follow up to Fuyavai's question, and that one that okay. you were answering. That that is, uh, how is, how do we, can we bring down rates? How do we slow rates? I know you said early on you said about expenditure. Maybe if you could help us sort of help what that means. <coughs> Tomatoes cost something like three times the amount. Fuels up, mm-hmm. taxes are up, or everything's yep. up. And on top of that, some of us are getting three four hundred dollars extra paying out for our rates and we know that that's going to pump up and it hurts it hurts us emotionally mentally uh, as well as economically so we okay. know that that's that's quite brutal that one and <clears throat> wait i'll wait I'll wait for that one and then i'll give you the other one that i've been asked to ask you okay rates will never ever well no that's wrong rates can come down because some people in this latest rates change actually reduced because of the calculation not because of less expenditure or less income needed. It was purely, they, they changed the calculation and, and I, I wanna look at it. The cost of living crisis is, is not in council's hands. That is definitely government. Yep. The council doesn't determine the price of a bottle of milk or, or a block of cheese. And even I sit here with the wife and say, well, should we buy cheese in this shopping trip or we're we gonna leave it? Because Oh my God, you know, we can go, we can go a couple of weeks without a block of cheese. We'll just do something else. Um, and that's unfortunately not a council purview. So it is a rates thing because that's the expenses. Um, it's a matter of expenditure. So it's, <clears throat> here's an example. It's only one. In Wellsford, they've just finished, or well, they're just about to finish fully commissioning a brand new public toilet paid for by council or technically paid for by the rate payer. It costs $1.3 million to put in a public toilet. $1.3 million. That's insane. It's a public Mm. toilet. It's not two houses. So that's expenditure that shouldn't have happened. To me, that's a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So that should have saved a million bucks straight away. That's the expenditure. There was a... Another example was a footpath was put into a park on the North Shore back in 2019. It was $5 million for a couple of hundred meters of concrete footpath. And the excuse they used was, well, there was geotech we had to do. We had to survey the ground. We had to make it safe. We had to do some engineering. Excuse me, it's a concrete path. Sorry, but no, that's not happening. That's expenditure. And we've got to bring that under control. Another wonderful example is in in the contract system, uh, you, the rate payer, paid a glazier from Pukekohe to repair a council window in Walkworth. So so you paid this contract right across Auckland to fix a piece of glass. That's expenditure. We've got to pull that down. And I want to go right into it, though, because inside council, I want someone to be going through like they would their own business. And they look at it and they're going, where are we wasting money in the company? Not externally with contracts and maintenance, but in the company itself. Where are we bleeding money? Is it with our uh, throwaway items, with, with supplies? Is it what consumables are we going through here that's costing us millions of dollars a year? That's expenditure. We've got to bring all those things under control tiny bit by tiny bit look after the pennies pounds take care of themselves it's it's simple budgeting for any household and and my final example on that is if you've got a 32 inch tv hanging on your wall and you it works but you think i'd really like a 70 inch qled tv uh 
the budget's not quite there, but I can go borrow some money and do it. No, you don't do it because the 32 inch TV is doing the job. So that's the difference between nicety and necessity. That's wants and needs. You don't need it, you want it. It's the same in your house and, 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 and all of us live like that every day. We analyze, we go, do we need it or do we just want it? And that's what determines what you spend. To me, council's got to have that same mentality. <clears throat> and and you make that change from the top. So uh, to, to, to make change, you lead with standards you would expect. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a sports team. If you want to change it, the coach has to lead with the standards that the coach would expect of his team. Same with council. So I'll go in with these this this mentality, the standard of mine of purse strings, budget, service, what do we need? So that, that's how I want to do it. So the preferred contractor system is a major, major expense on us that is as a rort. I know I'm not going to get their votes. I know that because they won't want me in there. These these major contractors. That's the last thing they'll want. So mm. so I hope that I hope that answered. I was a bit long winded again in my answer. All right. All good, all good. No, no, well done, well done. Look, and I'll just do, I'll just do a quick one on the last one that I was asked to pass over to you before I pass it on to to my fellow co-hosts. You're, you're doing well. You're doing well. We're going to about probably about three, three more questions, including this one. Uh, okay, so you and I fuck up up back to to iwi, right? You're Maori, I'm Maori. Uh, our other two island, well, I, again, I managed to scrape all three, all four. The we know that you're against three waters. No problem. Easy. Easy done. What about co-governance overall? And what about things like the Tupuna Maunga Authority uh, and the, uh, you know, and things like the infamous example you, I'll use of the guy whose window was smashed. He wanted to put in something cooler in place of that window and he ended up gave, giving up because not only was he going to pay out for for the RMA and also for the glazier itself, but also he had to do consultation with the local iwi that ended up being something in the in the it ended up being like a four digit figure to to engage that. So, what are your thoughts about co governance in, in that area? Okay, um, we'll start with the uh, the TMA, the the, the Munger Authority. They were set up to serve uh, all of Auckland, regardless of uh, race creed or religion if you're an Aucklander mm -hmm. we are here to serve you the TMA they have not done that they've created an empire uh, they are very anti-colonial because they've decided that the trees they will chop down they are calling them exotics and that's their way of getting around it and they have a an ideology that is not for Auckland it's for themselves so they're a major issue and they're an example of a co-governance that should work that is not working Co-governance, to me, is wrong. I disagree with it entirely. I'm all for co-advice, cooperation, working together, and, and, and coming up with solutions. But to govern, if it's a position where you're governing a community or a segment of the community, it, the community should be voting you in. You should not be getting into that position based on DNA. So I do not agree with race-based policies and governance. Three Waters has that. They wanted co-governance. TMA is co-governance. I would like to change it. They're trying to change the Hauraki uh, Golf Forum to be co-governance, and I disagree with it entirely. If it's just a group and their job is to, like a trust or a board, to look after something, they have to be voted on. Um, the council has to be voted on. That, that's why I also have a problem with Māori wards. I don't think they're fair for the overall community. You should be there on merit, and you should be there voted for the people, by the people. And that's what I firmly believe in. Mm -hmm. So co-governance is a big no-no for me. There's obviously parts where I have no say, and I can't do anything about it because it's in law. But if there is a place where I can fight against it, I will be, because it's just wrong. And, you know, I, I did the spit test. I've got my DNA back, and I know that I'm 39% Ngāti Rua Nui from Hawara, South Taranaki. Oh, uh, cool. Very good. 
So I finally found, and only this year I found the iwi, and that's all been done via the DNA test. But you'll never, ever hear me say I could be, or, or you'll hear me say it now, but I never pushed the fact that I could be the first Māori mayor. I'm not. I'm a New Zealander, and I'm an Aucklander. So I'm a Kiwi. And, and every immigrant and every race and culture, to me, I'm completely colorblind. I know you've got an accent. I know you look slightly different, but you're an Aucklander, you're a Kiwi, you're a New Zealander, and that's how you'll be treated by me, and that's how I want to be treated. So that's why I'm fully against the co-governance system. Mm. Gorgeous. Uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Liao, Liao, your last question. Yes, Craig. Um, I want to ask you how we can better safeguard against future potential water and power shortages in our growing city. Hmm. The water one is very close to actually being solved, I think. Um, they've, they've got themselves access to more water out of Waikato, which is nice. I, I find it, again, a little bit distasteful that they have to pay a giant fee um, uh, to use water that's all of ours just because it runs through a slightly different bit of dirt than our area. Um, I actually thought as Kiwis, they would be saying, yep, come on, we'll help you out. You need water up there, no problem. Um, it all recycles through. So, But no, uh, they see a money-making opportunity and they grab it. So that was a bit, a bit of a shame. But anyway, that part's there. Uh, and I think they're looking at building some more dams is what I've heard. I've just got to double check on that for the population increase that is coming. They do, they're estimating that there'll be a million more people in Auckland by 2030. So that's a, a big jump of people. That's a lot of toilets to be flushed, a lot of showers, a lot of cup of tea. Um, uh, hopefully baths are a thing of the past because they use up way too much water. Um, oh, actually, no, there's an argument there. Some people say they use less than a shower. I guess it depends how many kids you got at home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so <clears throat> uh, that's, that's in regards to the water. Power is a major problem now too. Yeah. And especially if they want us all to jump in electric cars, which at the moment the infrastructure oh. can't cope with. It's just, it's ridiculous. And, and oh, get me started on climate change. Um, so the electric car system and they want us, uh, look, we've got major problems coming with our power. We are, uh, uh, we do have good because we've got the hydro and we've got some wind farms, but I think technology is coming. We will start to use tidal power. We'll start start to use a lot more solar but the solar is not as green as people think because the mm -hmm. solar panels don't last forever and they're very very difficult to recycle just like the batteries out of an electric vehicle and let's not talk about making the batteries for an electric vehicle yeah. what that's doing to the planet so yep there are big problems that are going to have to be solved and again council's going to have to be knocking on the door one of the projects i'm i'm really pushing hard for i know it's going to get some pushback from the greens is a waste to energy plant. I've I've been pushing for one for four years. I want a lobby government to build one. I think the ideal place is Mere Mere. And the reason for that is it has all the facilities there. It has road, rail, water, and power lines. They're all there. We build a waste to energy plant. <clears throat> we don't have to build landfills anymore. Well, you still do because you've got the filter that gets buried, but the, the amount of space required is, is not anything compared to what a current landfill is there's people out there who hate waste to energy plants <laughs> um uh, but i'm not one of them <laughs> i think they're great they're not an incinerator of the old days you know they're not a furnace these things are high tech and and there's no emissions there's no emissions <clears throat> we can get rid of our rubbish and that creates power uh, mm. so We've got to do it. They're doing it overseas. Uh, I think Perth are building one in Aussie. They're, I'm surprised Aussie were a bit slow off the mark, and I think that's because of the Greens over there. They're pretty powerful, and they stopped it. Uh, they've stopped a couple being built down South Island, but I think we could get it across the line with the modern technology that's available. They've built a bio-waste-to-energy plant, um, which is where the food scraps are going to go, but it's not to the level that I'm, I'm talking about. And this, this one will will help our buddy there who's all about Pacifica tonight. Hey, mate, hey, this will be good for you. <laughs> is if we built a waste-to-energy plant 
we could import the waste from the Pacific Islands, put it through the waste to energy plant. They don't have to bury it anymore because where is it going over there? Where's mm. the waste going? Well, oh, yeah, well hey, in the Pacific. hey, brothers yeah. and sisters, we'll help you out. We'll take it, put it in a container, mm. and let's get it over here. We'll burn it for you, and we'll turn it into power. So, yeah. Oh, well done. Well done. For you, Abai, last question goes to you also. Oh, you're on the mute. Oh, there yes. you go. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's been a real pleasure having you and um, really enjoyed listening to you tonight. And uh, this one's not going to be so much a Pacifica question as it is a people question. Okay. Um, two things. Uh, are you concerned at all about the um, election integrity here in, in uh, regarding the elections? How How is... Um, I know that, that it's very difficult for conservatives in this day and age to actually uh, be treated fairly within the media. I'm just wondering if uh, you're only getting a fair shake with those of us here in alternative media as opposed to those who are outside in the uh, mainstream. Yeah, I do believe that. Um, and I know it, it, it could come across as sour grapes. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just upset because I'm, I don't have the profile of the others, but I do believe that. And I, and I also speak on behalf of the other candidates, particularly in the local body election who do not get any coverage. And it's something we spoke of earlier in this, in this chat. <clears throat> um, they don't work fairly. They seem to pick who they want and they'll promote and they'll do fluff stories and they'll make sure they get plenty of coverage if it's in their benefit. And, and I, I, I firmly believe that they'll deny it, of course. Uh, of course, they'll say, no, 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 we're fair mm. to everyone. Um, we just want, we'll only talk to the top raters. Well, okay, you're, you're creating the top rater. That you're doing that by the way you work and the way you promote. So I was pleased, though, in saying that, I was pleased about two weeks ago when Newsroom, albeit I think Newsroom are a fairly left-leaning. Very outfit. left. Yep. Uh, it was Mark Jennings, one of the co-editors, who actually wrote an article. And he's in, in the title of it, Craig Lord, the man ignored. And I was like, wow, okay, I better read this. And he actually gave the media a bit of a serve for the way they treated me and some of the other candidates. So he was actually giving his own media a serve. Um, and then, of course, on the same day, one of his other editors did a fluff piece on the other two candidates. So I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> God, do they not even read their own stuff internally? So, so it was nice that he admitted that yeah, it's not quite fair, and it needs to be looked at. Whether anything will come of it, I do not know. But mm. the same thing happens in Central. Um, that's going to be uh, <coughs> very interesting to see how that pans out next year when mm. the media start playing around. But definitely in the locals, um, they've picked on... Well, they were picking on four, sort of five with me, um, and nothing from the others. And some of the others had some good things to say. They have had across the debate. Uh, to be fair, uh, there's always a lot of crazies who put their hand up uh, mm. for, for election. And they've got every right to do so. And they're probably upset with me now by calling them crazies. But if you're an activist or you're doing it for that, you're not doing it for the real role, which is to serve the people. You're just doing it for your own uh, self-serving purpose. So that's a bit different. Um, and the media have to wade through that. I get that. They've got to scroll through the names and work them out. So, but when it comes to the people at the top end, what I consider the top end, yeah, they pick and choose what they want to do, and it is a, a little distasteful, and it's a, it's a heck of a fight. But I like a fight, and one of the, the two things I'm counting on, for if I talk personally now for this election, is I'm counting on the Kiwi attitude of backing the underdog, the Kiwi battler, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, lots of Kiwis will look at me and go, yeah, he's us. He's, a, he's the Kiwi battler and we've got his back. We'll, we'll, we want this guy because he represents us. And the other thing I'm hoping for is the, uh, is the social media side. The spread that you can get out of social media is very powerful. The mainstream media use it to try and promote themselves, but they like to ignore it. They don't want to consider it a powerful tool because it'll nullify themselves. So um, they don't believe that you can do anything powerful with social media. I do. And I think there's a big groundswell out there. And I think in coming elections, 
a lot of candidates from general and local body will realise, because not many really have been pushing it like I have on social media, um, and and they'll realise that, hey, this is actually a powerful tool. And, and if I am successful, oh, fingers crossed, I'm, I'm feeling confident, then I can say social media, and that'll suddenly all the other candidates in the future will go, ooh, hang on, he was on to something here. So, yeah, lead the way, woohoo. Mm. Oi, oi, <laughs> no, well done, well done. Yeah, well, you, you, it looks like you've got quite a few people in the audience section that who are going to vote for you. Uh, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'll be, I'll be transparent and honest and open. <laughs> yep, I'll be voting for you as well. I think that uh, exactly what you say. I think that you are, uh, uh, I think that you are a man of of integrity, and I love your ideas. Your ideas are great, and things like, for example, that under the under guard monorail style. Not it's not a monorail, but it's the closest thing I can come to it. I happen to know of that idea, and I've even looked at the figures. The figures back it. it uh, it's, mm. it's insane to me that Auckland Transport and Auckland Council have never looked at it properly. Uh, just shocking. So well, well look, just very quickly, very quickly mm. in 2019 when I brought it up for the first time. It was the same time that they were presenting new options to the government for the light rail idea and other transport options. And Phil mm. Twyford, who was the uh, transport minister at the time, said, oh, no, we haven't even looked at anything above ground. So that's the mentality, mate. They don't even bother. Yep. Right. Yep. <clears throat> right. Uh, Liao Fuavo, a couple of uh, points. Any, any last points there for our men? Um. Well, Craig, thank you so much for just answering just honestly. And, you know, there will be so many people who are going to support you uh, in, in this walk towards you becoming there. And, uh, yeah, I just want to honour you tonight. I, I really have appreciated your, your heartfelt concern for people. It's very refreshing and it's really important because, you know, I've, we've said this over the last, you know, few years is that, the word minister is to serve, and that's how we've always seen what a minister is. And, and all the ministers that are in parliament, you know, they have been very self-serving. So we are um, just really grateful for you being able to be available, but also to have really good answers to some, some of them pretty difficult questions. So thank you and all the best for you. Thank you. you. Very yeah. humbling. Thank you. Yeah. If we have a... I was just going to say that um, uh, just following up on, on what uh, Leal said, that uh, in regards to all the Pacifica questions that I brought up, it's really good to, to hear someone who actually um, is concerned enough to actually consider uh, consider the, the question and, and try to answer it in the best way possible. Um, I think that uh, uh, one of the problems that, that we have, uh, that we we face here in South Auckland, I think, is that um, it's like um, a lot of the issues may not be mainstream issues, and if they're not mainstream issues, then they they get lost in the, um, yeah. you know, and so uh, some of the, vo uh, the concerns that I voiced tonight actually were things that maybe not a lot of people are actually concerned about. But it's good to hear that you actually uh, have a heart and a desire to, and that's and I think that's that's all that that people in, in the Pacific community want to know, is that they're dealing with someone who who's on who's honest and straightforward, and you know, and and is caring enough uh, to actually take on whatever they they are concerned about. So uh, kudos to you and all the best. Yeah, once again, uh, you do have my my vote as well. Um, I unfortunately can't speak on behalf of the entire Pacifica community. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, uh, Pacific community tends to vote uh, like as one group. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure that um, if Fessel is doing his best to try to lock that down, unfortunately, uh, uh, we're looking forward to the day that, that our people will be more open-minded and actually um, uh, vote, you know, uh, along the lines of, uh, of of knowing people as opposed to just voting as a group. Yeah, look, awesome. I, I appreciate I appreciate that, guys. I mean, um, we are here to serve. That's why you put your hand up. Uh, mm. The council's role is to serve the people. It's their job. And, and I will be <clears throat> um, instilling that into every single person who works in every department of council, that 
if you don't really want to serve the people, you shouldn't be here. This is not for you. And that's that's what the role is. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited by it. I genuinely am excited by the idea of, of getting in there and getting, getting my hands dirty and, and trying to make it what it could be because Auckland is a really cool place. It's a good city. Mm. There's a lot of good here. And there are issues, but they're solvable. And, and I'm excited about the idea of making the bad things good and the good things even better. And that's and that's what's it's got me excited about doing it. So I'm willing to put my hand up and, and give it a shot. So hopefully we get enough votes across the line. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we look. Uh, thank you to all of our audience. Thank you so much for being in here and sending all your korero through, all your talado through. It's really, really great. We will be making sure that we split this this little into up uh, into bite sized pieces as well because we think it is quite important for you to hear yes. what this man has to say. We thank you so much for joining us. We thank you for everything you guys have been doing out there as well. In the meantime, we'll hear from Liao if we can ask you to finish us off in the appropriate way that we do, uh, and then we'll say good night. Sure. Lord, we just want to thank you tonight for yes, just, um, Lord, for truth. Um, yes. Lord, we thank you that we can uh, bring our questions and just heartfelt questions from uh, both our audience and ourselves uh, mm-hmm. towards our potential mayor. Lord, you know what's going to happen in October, and we just ask you for your favour and blessing yes. over Craig as he continues to pursue uh, what, what his role and responsibilities will be as mayor. We just ask you, God, to bless them and all the others who are wanting to pursue truth, who are standing uh, throughout this country uh, in different councils, Lord, who who want to speak truth and who want to serve the people. So we just pray these things and we thank you for blessing us and being with us tonight. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you guys. God bless you all. And we'll see you on the next one. Fa. 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 Fa.